Hello everyone, this is Denise at Something Beautiful Handcrafts, and this is a studio vlog. Uh, studio vlogs are a little different if you haven't watched any before, uh, in that I'm just pretty much chatting. I'm not doing a tutorial or showing off any anything in particular, and it's generally whatever it is I'm working on, not necessarily always fiber arts. So at any rate, I've been reflecting on my YouTube videos, especially in the midst of this global pandemic and how things are basically going to change. They'll never be the same again. So I've been making YouTube videos for some time now. I think maybe three years, I want to say. I have some videos that are a little older than that, but they weren't really YouTube videos for a channel. And for the most part, I've just been kind of haphazardly making videos. A lot of them were for friends who needed to uh, know how to do something in particular. And the easiest way to share it was to do YouTube. Uh, some of them were for clients who were actually paying. And the easiest way to do it was YouTube. And that's really before like the whole Zoom thing, or I paid any attention to Zoom. Uh, and then... At some point I decided that I would actually try to grow my channel, but it was more because I wanted it to be productive and not so much that I had a goal to grow a channel or to be popular or anything like that. So it's only been the past year where I've actually started looking into strategies or things that need to be done to actually grow a YouTube channel. And it's only been the past couple of months where I decided that at some point in order to get this channel to um, really prosper, I needed to make it profitable. And then I know sometimes like for creators or as far as like artists, profitable is a dirty word, but I don't really want it to be. It's just that it takes a lot of time and effort to, first of all, make a video from the filming to the editing to the actual publishing. But even more than that, when you're a crafter, you are consuming a lot of materials in order to make this video. And if you're consuming materials without a target audience, then you're, you're almost like you're wasting because I'm spinning yarn that doesn't have an audience, so I'm using up something that uh, might not be what I need it to be because I'm doing it for a specific thing or I'm making something that doesn't sell or won't sell because I'm trying to uh, cover a specific topic so uh, it becomes a little unprofitable so you, you're kind of burning through money or time and time is money in one way or the other when you're just making videos to make videos and especially with the breed studies where I have to get or purchase these all these different fibers and so i'm not getting a return on them when i'm purchasing them just to make videos that aren't actually um you know bringing back any type of monetary you know compensation or anything so i think you understand where i'm going with this so what i i decided is that i have to find some way that i can continue making videos but it's not a financial drain or a time drain and uh, considering some of the avenues of funding this you know through my own earnings have closed because um, the craft fairs and the teaching uh, classes that I all had scheduled for this current year of course are all gone so that limited funding you know has other places it needs to be so I decided that I'm really going to work really hard as much as I possibly can because like I said, I, I, have to, I have to put in enough time to earn money to live. So I'm, the time to, that I'm using to make videos kind of takes away from the time that I'm doing active things to make money. So quite frankly, the videos, they need to lead to some type of financial compensation. And it's a catch-22 because in order to monetize YouTube or in order to get some type of profit from this, you have to, you really have to work. You really have to put a lot of energy into it. 
And that same energy and time um, is what you need in order to, you know, work on your regular life. So at any rate, it's just, it's going to be complicated. So I had to really decide uh, and narrow down and niche down as to what's going to happen with these videos. I don't want to just stop making videos. Um, because when you do that, you can, you can lose the traction. But at the same time, I've started working on uh, classes for user experience design. And I'm hoping to break into that career. And we're competing for time with this, with the whole UX design and with the YouTube videos. Okay, so to combat that, what I've been doing is making little shorts, calling it Maker's Monday. And that allows me to keep the YouTube algorithm going because I'm actually making videos and posting videos, but I don't have the burden of making really long videos anymore that consume a lot of time with longer projects. So I hope that makes some sense. What that also means though is you're probably going to see a lot of me campaigning to get more users. Before it was pretty much, you know, at the end of my video, hit like, subscribe, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. I wasn't really trying to get a bunch of users. It's just they say you should say that, so I just toss it in. But now I really need to move up in the game of subscriptions. So that's going to become pretty much a campaign across all my social media platforms. Like, subscribe, you know, tell me what kind of videos you'd like to see. I am open because I want my channel to be uh, basically tutorials and answering questions that you would need to ask uh, another spinner in order to improve your spinning skills. So not so much of me just droning on and on. I'm actually would like to just to be a teaching channel. So if you need, you know, some information or you need to see something done, just you know, type it in the comments. Hey, I want to see this. Cause this is this is not a a vlog channel where you're just, you know, peering into my life and seeing what products I'm using and what things I'm making. This is more than that. This is educational. So tell me what it is that you need. Also, too, besides that, uh, I will probably be more overtly stating what I have for sale in my Etsy shop. And I, oh, I've, I've said it. I've said it on Facebook. I've said it on Instagram. I was actually one of my best posts on Instagram. I've said it in my videos. I really hate selling to people. It just feels disgenuine, which is actually a real word. And it feels that way. Um, it feels artificial, a little contrived, and I don't, I don't like it. But you know what? It really is what needs to be done. If I want to continue offering free content to people, I, it has to work out that way. You know, if I was, if I had the classes set up and was able to do the classes the way that I had intended this year, I would, you know, be selling this information to people. And sorry, you can't see what I'm doing. I'm actually putting the yarn on the cone and on the cone winder which is a little hard to do when you're trying to stay out of the camera shot. Okay, so here we go. If I was, you know, teaching the classes in person, they for sure would cost money. So if I want to continue to give out this information for free, which I might add other people are clearly charging 
for their classes. They're on Craftsy. Uh, they're on Etsy. They are doing Patreon. And they're asking for subscriptions. And these tutorials and classes and the feedback that they get are indeed things that are tiered for the Patreon members. And I'm not doing that. I'm just making videos. And I'm doing it for free. And I'm taking my time. So instead, what I'm going to really start doing is showcasing the stuff that I am preparing, like the roving or the bats that I'm preparing and some of the yarns that I have dyed. And I'm, I'm going to start putting shameless plugs into my videos. That's just pretty much, I want to be realistic there. You know, one of my favorite YouTubers is just so cool. And he says in the middle of his videos, you know, if you're getting value out of this, smash that like button and hit subscribe if you haven't already and share with your friends. And you know what? I'm at that point now. Like, you know what? If I'm showing you how to process raw wool and giving you tips and tricks, and this is helping you become a better spinner or a better dyer, a better knitter, a better weaver, or what have you, you know, click that like button subscribe if you haven't share with your friends and if there's something that you see and you or you don't see and you want to know put it down in the comments i'll get that fixed if there's something you want to say hey you should do this more of this or less of that go ahead and put that down there too because i want to make this work it has to work okay so let me move right along what i'm doing is i am winding this sock yarn from the Swift onto the cone winder. And this is different than a ball winder. Okay, so I have bobbins right here, plastic bobbins, and they have bobbin holders. And this is how I crank the yarn uh, from this onto the sock knitting machine. Now the circular sock machine, oh, sorry, here you go. Circular so sock machine is really sensitive when it comes to tension. So if I'm trying to wind from a skein or a ball or any other preparation, which I have to say I do, you know I do. I do all kind of stuff like that. Um, I, but usually what I do is when I have the, the commercial balls of yarn, I pull out chunks so that it won't uh, create drag. Because you're going to get extra tension when you're pulling out from a center pull ball and the machine will change the uh, stitches per inch when it has that extra tension so you don't really want that so to make the tension as even as possible you wind it onto here and uh, maybe I'll do a the second half of the video and I'll show you the difference between the ball winder and the cone winder uh, this is a royal cone winder and my ball winder is a uh, knockoff of a royal then there is a big difference. So anyway, scanning these guys up, or I should say coning these guys. And then I'll take you to the sock knitting machine. probably lost like half the folks there at my little rant but well if you're a hand crafter then you understand so moving right along this is the ball winder and this is the cone winder and you can see immediately that there is a difference besides the fact that this one is like really dusty the ball winder right here kind of tilts to the side and basically, for the most part, it's meant to be used um, without a hat on. I don't know if those, it never occurred to me to try that. I might try one of those cones and see what actually happens. At any rate, it's on an angle, and I make center pull balls from that. And you know, not as much as I used to, because of course, I have to do everything the quick and dirty method. So, well, if I can get away with um, knitting from um, the actual skein, which I do a lot, or if I can, you know, 
if I'm plying with more than one bobbin, which happens now more than it used to happen, I don't make as many center pull balls. So, poor thing, feels a little neglected. Now, over here on the Royal, you can see that it's the shaft here, I guess I could call that a shaft, is in the upright position. And uh, there's an arm here that comes out. And it's supposed to come out uh, like that. Or maybe it's supposed to be like that. I'm not really sure. I need to see that at work. But it has this guide right here. Makes sure that the yarn is guided in an up and down motion. So that it's really nicely tensioned and organized cone there. A really nice thread guide over here. And it's designed to work with the hat on the top. Basically, still same clamp, clamp, same crank kind of style. And I don't, I don't really use them interchangeably. It's either one for one purpose and pretty much this for the circular sock machine and occasionally for the Centro machine. But it, it just, like I said, it's a, it frees and makes even tension so that the yarn moves freely. And it actually moves a lot more freely than it would in the center pull ball because there's still tension. Oh, sorry about that. There's still tension in the center pull ball and this eliminates it completely. I have an Etsy order for socks. And so this is a good time for me to show you what it is that I do when I receive Etsy orders. I think I had a, a video on what happens when fiber to spin comes in and this is what happens when socks come into crank. Okay, so if you haven't seen the sock video already that explains me walking through the machine, um, then you haven't seen this page right here. And this is not mine. I wish I had thought about it, <laughs> but uh, this is from Let's see, it says the 1764shepherdess.com. And that particular website, the lady does historical um, knitting and other different things. And so she has a sock machine and she made this chart in order to keep track of your socks. It was a great idea. And it was free to download. So here I am. Uh, I will, if I remember, I'll put a link to this one here. If not, it's there's a link in the sock knitting machine um, section, the Inzac playlist. There's a link to it there. Okay, so at any rate, I keep track of almost all of the socks I make. Uh, generally, if I'm repeating a particular sock, like I made a bunch in series, then I don't do each one. But what I do is... Um, I have numbers on the top of the pages to tell me what number sock, and then I'll do like a dash. It'll be number 18 through 20 or whatever. One of those pages in here is labeled like that, and it's the same sock in different uh, colors. So at any rate, uh, this is a different yarn, and it is a different size, so it, it gets its own page, of course. I don't know what happened to that one over there. So at any rate... I'll fill out the finished sock. I'm going to jot down the yarn where it came from. This is Vesper Sock Yarn. Um, I'm not familiar with this particular indie dyer. It is a beautiful yarn. Okay, so I fill it in. And it really helps. And I put the color ways and things here so that if it's something that I would like to go back to, I can get it. Of course, the CSM I'm using is the Inzac. It is currently the only one I have. I am doing eight stitches per inch, which is actually what's recommended on the label. And I'm going to use my 64, which there isn't a mark here for 64, so I just write it in. And I have the foot length and the number of needles I'm using, of course, is 64. I'm going to do this cuff down. It's going to be hemmed. I may or may not do a ribber 
uh, or no, mock rib, it'll be one or the other. And then I plot out my row counts. So what I did with this yarn is I cranked the entire tube out. And what that does at the gauge that it's supposed to be, it gives me a rough idea of how many rows this tube for the yardage will crank out to. This is all rough, but it's, it's nice to have an estimate of how much I have to work with. There's 428 yards of yarn. So I'm going to put that down here in my notes. 428. And I had 418 rows crank out. So I'm going to divide this roughly. So I have roughly 209 rows for each sock to play with. So it just gives me like rough estimates. And then what I do is for the size of the foot, I it what's needed for the size of the foot is pretty constant. Okay, so I would fill that in. And the I use the measured threads sock calculator. And uh, I like that one. It's worked for me good, so I just stick with it. It also gives me a rough estimate for the heel and the toe. I never find that to be quite um, the same for that one. Now, I know when I do my socks, when I first did the socks for my foot, I actually paid attention to what the heel and toe was. So when I crank out a pair for me, I already know that at the stitches per inch that I was using, this would be my heel and this would be my toe. So I added that in here. So in this case, I'm going to take the calculation from the measure thread for the heel and toe and kind of give it a little bit of wiggle room. I also know what the cuff is going to be. So whether I do mocked rib or the river, it does, actually doesn't matter. I'm going to hang this hem. So if I want a hem that's going to be, well, a cuff that's going to be three inches, then I know how many stitches per inch I have, which is eight. So I multiply that, and I know that I need to have um, 48 rows for this cuff, or if I'm going to fold it over, because then 48, I need 24 to get three inches. I'm hanging it over, so I need 48 rows for this cuff. Okay, so these are some things I would already have blocked in. I'd have the 48 blocked in. I'd have whatever this measurement is going to be blocked in. And then I would kind of have these sort of blocked. And I know approximately what the, the calculator says is going to be. Then I would know how much, how many rows I have left in order to make this the maximum length I can make it using up the maximum amount of yarn. So I want to use up all of it if at all possible, and have very little waste left. I mean, at this point, I have maybe three, four yards left. And I think that's pretty good in this case. Um, if I was only making a tube, you know you'd have some left over to make the heel and toe, but since I'm making the complete sock, I just wanna go ahead and use it all. And so basically, that's what I do. Now, I have four skeins from this customer. So once I complete one sock, and I have very specific calculations. I can put the next sock and I can just make them all the same because they're all going to be the same size sock. Bam. That makes it really easily. Of course, then at the bottom, you know, you put who it's made for, date, all that other stuff. Hem, leg, foot. That stuff is down here. And I keep track of all of that. It also helps too that for some reason I was ever using this yarn. Again, let's say she sends more then I, I have a really good idea for this yarn, what tension it likes. So what I did was I cranked it into a tube, and this is recommended. And it's not just recommended for beginners. Whenever you're using a different um, sock yarn, they all behave differently. You know, um, the alpaca sock yarn was super, super stretchy. And when I did it at eight stitches per inch, it was just... A really floppy sock so um, I had to take it up to nine and even at nine it was like a super floppy sock so actually that one I'm cranking at almost 11 stitches per inch just to get the right feel for it and where'd that guy go off to oh here it is okay so here it is at 11 stitches per inch 
Okay. If I did that with the Croy sock, it would be stiff as a board. Um, the Merino sock that came from uh, Dyer Supply is cranked at nine and a half, ten. It needed to be cranked more at a tighter gauge than the Croy sock. It was totally different. And these are all sock weight, fingering weight type yarns. But the, what they're made from does make a difference in the tension that you used. And remember too that yarns have ranges. So a fingering weight can have a, a range. Well, on my spinner's control card, it says from 19 to 22 wraps per inch. So you've got two to three wraps per inch that can, you know, make a difference here. So what goes through the machine at one tension doesn't necessarily feel the same in a different yarn if you use that same tension. So you have to make the adjustment yourself. All right, so going down to the sock machine. I had gotten like really deep into the whole sock when it occurred to me that this is not a sock video, this is a studio vlog. So I need to talk about something more than just the socks. I'll get back to the socks later in their own separate video when I have a chance to consult my sock mentor about part of the project that I was doing. So at any rate, I'm moving on to the cards again, and I'm back to cards. For those of you who haven't seen any of the other videos, um, I've been hand making cards or making cards by computer uh, pretty much since elementary school and middle school where they had the print shop. I don't know if you ever used that print shop program and you print out the cards on the dot matrix printer and all the print masters and all those kind of programs or even just hand painting cards. So I started up again in order to make cards to go with the items that I sell. So if you ever bought anything from me, you've had a handmade card uh, come with that item. So at any rate, I'm making my 100 cards for Christmas. I do this every year for my church and we pass these out throughout the neighborhood with little Christmas goodie bags. So this year's card, uh, I found these embossing folders at Michael's actually. And they are really neat and they came with a die. That says joy to the world. And so here is the card. Sorry about my hands. I just came from outside gardening. I just realized, oh my goodness, I've got the dust all over my hands. Anyway, you can see this card. And I use a little glimmer spray with the embossing. I've always wanted some of that shimmer uh, glitter spray. I'm not a big fan of glitter, but this spray is really cool. And I figured I'd give it a try, and it came out wonderfully. I really enjoy it. So I'm glad I got it. And this one has the Joy to the World already stuck on it. So this is what the complete finished card will look like. And then I found this die. And I'm making the paper ornaments. So here they are. They're made from 65-pound foil cardstock. And I just put a, a piece of acetate on the back of them. I really wanted little wood discs, but by the time I really thought about it, it would they would take too long to get them here um, from where I want them. So this is just to give it just a little extra reinforcement. And I'll attach the string to it, and it'll go with the cart so that it can be hung up. And that's just a little part of what's going to go into the Christmas packages. We kind of had to rethink things this year because of the pandemic. We used to take goodie bags with cookies and candy, and we would walk the neighborhood the day before Christmas, sometimes actual Christmas, and we would pass out these really nice goodie bags. But all things considered, we're not really going to be able to do that. And so for the Christmas package, they just go on to the porches, you know, where there's no real contact when we send out the packets for the uh, neighborhood team. And we don't want to put things in the package that are going to be an issue because you, you know, you may have mice, you may have squirrels. There are definitely 
groundhogs in the neighborhood, possums, you know, what have you, and the miscellaneous, you know, cat or stray dog. And you don't want to put anything on the porch that's going to draw any type of nuisance creatures. So no cookies or anything like that. And the, to be honest, um, by now we've been doing this three years. So when they see the package, they know where it's from. But I just really wouldn't want to eat any, any random cookies that, you know, were tossed up onto my porch. So kind of stay on that idea. But just, just going to make the packets as nice as we possibly can and just be as crafty as I possibly can. I'm spinning the Falkland from the Maker's Monday video. When you're spinning as thin as I'm spinning, it does feel like it's going forever. So this is going to take a while. And it brings me to the question of time and videos. I try as much as possible to get to the point, just like I would uh, as a teacher in a classroom, short and sweet when it's at all possible. And I even break up videos so that they're generally no longer than 20 minutes, half an hour at the most. And that means that things are in a series sometimes that probably could have been done in one 40 minute or hour long video. But that seems like a lot of time for me. So I've been looking at some of the other vloggers and I am a little confused because I have seen vlogs that go on for an hour and the person is just sitting there talking, you know, or maybe they're knitting or showing you something, but they just talk on and on and on, not always about the a topic that's related to fiber arts. And so I was like, well, I don't even know if time has anything to do with it or not. I always thought, you know, people keep it short and sweet to the point. Or if it's not short, then it has to be like really exciting. I'm gonna have to talk in my exciting voice or I'm constantly you know, moving or have something constantly going on on the screen so that it can keep attention. But that does not seem to be how things pan out in the YouTube videos. So if you have any thoughts about that, about how long a video should really be, or you know, just drop something down in the, in the comments. So I kind of get a sense for it. Uh, sometimes I cut videos short because I'm so concerned about going over 20, 25, 30 minutes. And I've been trying to check my analytics to see if there's some kind of correlation between time and drop off point. I'm not really seeing anything. Okay, so at any rate, this Falkland, it's gonna take me a little while. I think I've only spun about two ounces of it. And uh, it's kind of low man on the totem pole here as far as things that need to be done immediately. Those cards kind of really need to be done immediately. I did send off my socks down to a friend in Texas who's having her grand opening of her holistic soap shop. So those are all the way. Pretty much right now in this order, of uh, four socks is on top and the socks that I'm working on uh, for alpacamom.com which is Julie who I mentioned in my Socktober video there's a her card is there in that video uh, pretty much that's the, my high on priority so after I get one of those items ticked off then I'm going to get back to this Falkland I do plan on making Vlogmas videos, so that might, uh, that might be what happens. The Vlogmas videos may be me finishing the Falkland, if I don't finish it before then, and I'm working with the Praxis Fiber Workshop here in Cleveland for the one year, one outfit. So Vlogmas might also become me processing a fin fleece to yarn or something of that nature in order to uh, make a video for those who have not processed a fleece. If you haven't processed a raw fleece, wool fleece yet, and you would like to see that, uh, let me know in the comments. Remember to click like if you like the video. You know what, if you don't like the video, It'd be nice if you would say why in the comments so I can fix some things instead of uh, 
trolling with a thumbs down. <laughs> if you've subscribed, thank you. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And click that little bell for notifications. Now that I'm actually uploading videos in a timely manner, that would be nice. Okay, everybody. Thanks for listening to me go on. Have a great day.